Hey everyone, I'm going to kill this music, so stand by while I get that done. And we'll cross fade into the old live stream here. What's up everyone? Happy Friday, and uh, it definitely is a happy Friday with some sneak peeks to Final Cut Pro 10. Is everybody pumped about today being launch day for the Mac Studio and... The studio display, maybe not the studio display as much, it's a little bit, oh, I don't know, for some of us, a bit of a downer. I got one, I'm gonna see what it's like, do some reviews on the channel, check it out, work it into some of my content, and we'll talk all about that today. Um, if you can take a second to just hit that like button to make sure that uh, the old YouTube algorithm sees this and helps to recommend it to other viewers who may be interested to know about what's going on with Final Cut Pro and the new Mac Studio. Um, Good to see everyone in chat. Caleb's here. James Wells, good to see you. Um, ben, good to see you. Mr. Camera Junkie, hello. I uh, just want to go over what we're going to do today in today's live stream. So first thing we're going to talk about iJustine's video that showed the beta version of Final Cut Pro 10.6.2 and two new features, one that I didn't cover in my video that I released yesterday, but two new features that we saw in the UI of Final Cut Pro during the making or during the watching of her video. So we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time on that, um, especially wondering if um, Justine broke her NDA. Apple usually does an NDA, I'm sure, with um, uh, the big YouTubers that get this stuff in advance. So we'll touch on that. Um, uh, I have uh, something to ask all of you uh, with my Medium account. Um, uh, we'll get to that also in today's show. Uh, we're going to talk about my Mac Studio arriving and uh, what I'm going to do to set it up in my edit bay. And we'll take a look um, at a photo of my edit bay and kind of break down what my plans are for incorporating the Mac Studio in the studio display into my main edit bay. Um, I also wanted to share with you a Final Cut Pro article about the Mac Studio and some interesting things that Peter Wiggins found in this article um, when it came to testing the Mac Studio Ultra with uh, export times to external SSDs versus the internal SSD. And then I think we'll wrap everything up by hanging out and chat for a while, answering any questions, and just jamming until we get to about 2 o'clock central time today where we'll wrap everything up. So... Again, it's good to see everyone today. I'm excited. Um, my Mac Studio is out for delivery right now, and unfortunately with UPS, because they're based in Omaha, and I'm actually on the other side of the river over in Iowa, they most likely are going to hit me at the end of their route, and typically we get deliveries between 5 o'clock and, gosh, during peak times, as late as 8, 9 o'clock. So I don't know if I'll get to a live stream unboxing today if it comes really late. Um, most of that's because I have kids at home, my wife's at home, we're trying to do dinner and get my kids routine and all that, so we'll see. But let's not spend a whole bunch of time talking about that. Let's get right into the meat of the show here, which is the big news with iJustine's video yesterday. I'm going to switch over to picture in picture, and uh, let's see here. What do I need to do? Let's go. And we'll leave the audio off. Cut there. Picture in picture. And you see I've got Justine's video up here. We're not going to watch it together. Um, um, I have some. I have a keynote that I put together with just some pictures, um, some screen grabs. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, a little bit more in depth than I did yesterday. Although, I'll be honest, there's not a ton that we can talk about when it comes to just this dupe detection feature that she uh, pointed out. Um, let's see. Let's pull up my keynote here and we'll go over um, what we saw in the video. Um, the big thing is with this, um, I was wondering, you know, just like some other Final Cut uh, fans that I was talking to on Twitter and in social media, Apple doesn't do this. They don't show us a sneak peek and let a YouTuber show a feature for, I don't want to say it's like officially an unannounced release of Final Cut, because technically during the Apple event, you know, in the fine print for the event, I think they showed somewhere that um, they were using a beta version of 10.6.2. So we, we sort of knew it was coming, but it, you know, hasn't been announced uh, in any 
uh, you know, in any sort of official capacity from Apple. So this really, for me, in, in my history of watching and following along with Final Cut Pro and other Apple software, I've never really seen them do something like this where Final Cut Pro is, you know, a, a sneak peek is given ahead of time. So I don't know, you know, hit me up in comments with a number one if you were shocked as well that they showed this ahead of time. Or a number two, if you were like, yeah, I was expecting this as part of the embargo for the Mac Studio, the Studio Display, and Final Cut Pro. Um, now, before we get into the features, I just want to kind of clear up the whole NDA thing with Justine and all of that stuff. Um, I wrote a, a quick article on Medium uh, yesterday just going over uh, the release. And Justine on Twitter, in my Twitter thread, replied that she did not violate an NDA, LOL and that she went on to say that the dupe detection feature has made a huge difference the last few days editing with it. I didn't think I'd use it as much as I did. Um, the whole NDA thing, you know, yes, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but again, some Final Cut Pro fans were like, is this video going to get taken down? Like, this never happens. Apple's always so secretive. Um, so, you know, the the part of me that knows a little bit about how this stuff works behind the scenes is like, there's no way Justine violated an NDA. She's a veteran YouTuber, one of the you know the the the, the most veteran YouTubers in the tech sector uh, that we all know uh, and watch her videos and all that. So there's no way that she violated an NDA. Apple. Um, I later found out through another YouTuber who DM'd me on Twitter to let me know that they also received a Mac Studio in advance as well as Final Cut Pro 10.6.2. All of that was included, and the reason that Apple gave 10.6.2 over and gave permission to show it in action was, you know, they wanted to invite YouTubers to show how powerful it was with the Mac Studio Ultra, especially as it relates to multiple streams of 8K. And if you saw Justine's video, she went on to demonstrate it playing back, I think, the 18 streams of 8K simultaneously in her timeline. I think I actually have a slide of sort of what that looked like. This is Justine stacking up all of those clips to play the 18 streams simultaneously. And this was very intentional from Apple. So again, for those of us that were a little shocked, me included, that we were able to see this and see a new feature, I was sitting there watching this video. This is, this is the funny part. I was sitting there watching this video, like staring at the UI, like what's different? Is there anything that we can see? And then, you know, I saw all this cross hatching. Um, on the uh, uh, on the timeline and in the timeline index, and I'm like, oh, what is that? It must be dupe detection. And then as I watch the video later on, um, let me get my picture and picture back up. Um, as I watch the video later on, she just comes right out and says it. I'm using a beta version of 10.6.2, and this is a new feature called dupe detection. Um, so you know, it's uh, it's a really exciting thing to get a little bit of a sneak peek of something before we've actually gotten the software update. Now, I have been checking the App Store for the software update, not necessarily because I'm dying to, to start benefiting from a new version of Final Cut, um, but because honestly, I really enjoy being one of the first YouTubers who puts out a video that breaks down the update, not only shows you, you all what you need to do to back up Final Cut um, so that you make sure you can roll back if you need to, whether or not the, um, the update is going to have a new XML version, whether or not the new update is going to require an update to your library. Um, I, I, I really like sort of breaking that news about the um, update as quickly as I can, so that's why I enjoy checking it. Plus, those videos do perform well. My video that I released yesterday is one out of ten on on my uh, Google Studio or my YouTube Studio dashboard, and it's, it's just an exciting thing to do to be a part of that, um, the energy and the excitement of that release. So that kind of sums up the whole thing. Justin didn't break an NDA, um, so all of us that were so. Um, tied into Apple secrecy, this is a little bit of a break from that. And part of me wonders if um, if there is maybe a little bit of a sea change happening when it comes to communicating things to pro users. You know, we saw sort of a all is lost dark night of the soul stretch after the 2013 Mac Pro came out where a lot of the pro community felt like Apple was moving away from a focus on them as they focused on iOS devices as well as their services like iCloud and things like that, and now Apple TV and all these other things. So there was a feeling of sort of being left behind, but the pros, I think, 
overall felt like they had really been a huge part of building Apple into what it was, and for them to make the trash can, which for a lot of people was a huge disappointment compared to the 2010 and earlier um, sort of version one of the cheese grater, where you could swap out graphics cards, add in hard drives, you know, all kinds of modularity that, that pros really wanted and needed, and the trash can wasn't that at all. We don't need to rehash all the issues with the trash can. I've had one for the last three or so years, and for my pro workflow, which is on the very low end, I think, of pro, because, you know, I edit local corporate and documentary-style videos, create video content for YouTube. I'm not editing huge feature films with sound turnover and visual effects turnover and color turnover, uh, multi multi-editor environments for television shows and streaming services. Um, so the 2013 Mac Pro is a good fit for my needs. Um, so so I think that 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 I I wonder if things like this a sneak peek at an application before we even have our hands on it. Which again I I don't think I've ever seen that happen with Final Cut Pro other than Apple is at an event, NAB vid summit whatever it is and they are demonstrating a new update and then that update rolls out later but even then i always felt like the update had already been released and they were talking about it somewhat after the fact um so so i want to hit up a couple of comments because we've got a lot of people in chat right now um i'm just going to switch back out of this and um we've got doc rock doc rock what's up hey yeah so doc rock's just reiterating Trust me, it was sanctioned. We don't make mistakes. Absolutely, Doc Rock, 100%. Um, but I did find it interesting that so many in the Final Cut community were wondering if this was a mistake by Justine and if Apple would pull down the video um, or ask her to pull it down. Um, I think we knew better, but you know, it was kind of fun to speculate because, again, this is not something that we regularly see from Apple. Um, and then Ben saying, I feel if it was unsanctioned, she'd have been made to take it down perhaps absolutely we would have seen that pretty quickly um what else we got marcos castile in here marcos welcome to the live stream so good to see you marcos wrote an awesome article on fcp.co um, the case against final cut pro which really outlined some of final cut pros areas of improvement and then some of its amazing features. Marcos, I love that article, so thanks for being here in the stream. I'll actually touch on that article a little bit later on when I'm talking about Peter's article about the interesting results that we got with the um, Mac Studio Ultra. Um, I think it's gonna be a good update. No way Apple would tease dupe detection earlier if that was the only thing coming. I'm certainly hoping for that as well. Again, staring at every frame of Justine's video and looking at the UI to try to find new features or new things that were different. Um, I haven't seen anything clearly there, but I am hoping that 10.6.2, if that is in fact the version that it's going to be, um, comes up with some, some additional features that pros like you, Marcos, have been asking for a long time. And your article outlined some of the things that you wish Final Cut could do that it doesn't. Um, I'll link to that article in the show notes, so definitely check out Marcos's article um, and learn more about what he's doing with Final Cut with commercial editing, um, which is really some amazing stuff. Um, Marcos just has another comment here I want to touch on. Also check out Apple's Final Cut Pro, still featuring a 27-inch iMac, not a single mention of the Mac Studio. That might mean something or they just forgot to update the page. Very true and good, good, good eye on that, Marcos. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Um, Let's see, who else do we got in here? All right, so let's go into what we're seeing with dupe detection. And then this other feature that showed up, which is voice isolation. I don't know if you guys noticed this, um, this voice isolation feature. I didn't go over it in my video yesterday because I didn't no notice it at first, but Raphael Ludwig, who's another friend of the channel and part of the Final Cut fam, he caught it and sent it to me on Discord, and then I put it out on Twitter. Um, so let's talk about this right now real quick because it's kind of a small thing that we can touch on and then go back to dupe detection. Voice isolation. So in the audio enhancements menu, I know for some of you who have looked through the EQ menu, you may have noticed a preset that's called voice enhance. So I'm curious what the difference is going to be between voice enhance and voice isolation. Here's um, something that Rene Ritchie pointed out to me on Twitter, he mentioned that he thinks that this is going to be connected to a lot of the neural engine cores that are a part of the M1 uh, chipset. 
And this might be maybe some kind of, he didn't say this part, but I'm speculating that this may be some kind of AI use of um, analyzing the audio and doing things to really isolate the audio. On Twitter, I speculated that I wonder for people who are using like TV clips and film clips under fair use, but are getting copyright hits constantly from YouTube. I wonder if this is something that they may be able to use to remove background music from a video um, and reduce those copyright strikes while still using the clip under fair use. Another situation where I think this might come up, and this actually heard about from Scott McKenna, who's a Final Cut Pro um, YouTuber. He doesn't do a ton of Final Cut Pro tutorials, but he edits in Final Cut Pro. Scott was on the Golden Hour podcast with Dave Mays, and he mentioned how a wedding film that he made that has a million views, and it was like basically start to finish, this is my day as a wedding filmmaker, and he it's a course basically teaching you how to do a wedding. Well, during one portion of that video, the violinist and maybe a small string band was playing music in the background, far off in the background, and he was talking. Well, that video got a copyright hit, um, and he was the video was demonetized while they sorted it all out. Scott goes on to say it was a, a very arduous process with um, YouTube going back and forth to try to get them to understand that this was just music that was playing from a live music thing in the background and it wasn't copywritten music. It was a whole ordeal. It ended up greatly impacting what his earnings were on the video, etc., etc., all because of this, this little small section of an hour, two hour long video that had some music in the background. So I wonder if something like this might help with that. I think the safe guess with voice, vo with, sorry, with voice isolation is probably something more along the lines of removing wind noise, maybe traffic in the background. We know that famously in films, when scenes are filmed next to the ocean or a water fountain or any sort of active water, often there's ADR recording of that dialogue that has to happen. Not saying that this will take the place of that for pro editors working on films and TV. But for us who are vlogging and doing content creation, um, maybe, you know, corporate video, that sort of thing, this voice isolation feature paired with AI slash neural engine cores will be able to analyze audio and really just look at the, the waveform or the, the frequencies of the human voice compared to all the other noise and try to isolate that weight, that, uh, those frequencies to remove background noise. How well it'll work? I don't know, I'll be honest, a lot of the audio enhancements in Final Cut, especially the stuff that's sort of automated, where you just kind of click a button and it's supposed to remove all the noise, I haven't had a lot of success with that. I know in Apple's demos, they tend to, to show these things as being, as working sort of like magic. You just click one button and it's gonna work. Even things like their white balance tool and color matching or you know shot matching, things like that, don't quite work as easily as marketed. So. Um, so I'll be curious uh, when we get the release of voice isolation, what we actually end up getting with that. But that was a cool addition to the little sneak peek that we saw from Justine. Um, but as far as dupe detection goes, this is again something that pros have been asking for a long time. I don't know how many of you who are um, watching the replay or here live with me um, have even know what dupe detection is. Uh, just to summarize very simply, it is a way for uh, an editing, a piece of editing software to indicate to you that you are using duplicate clips in your edit. And here on this, um, on this image with Justine, Apple is using in their UI design, uh, they're using this sort of cross-hatching pattern on the clips in the timeline index, and then also uh, and it's a little harder to see in this still, but also in the images here where you can see my mouse going, the, the, the clips that are actually on the timeline. Now, Justine's uh, demonstration, she just has one A-roll clip that has the same file name. So um, we're not seeing if there's any additional UI things that they're doing, like are they showing that each clip, you know, each clip that's duplicated maybe in a different color or a shade of this sort of purple blue color. Is there a different crosshatch design to denote that different clips um, uh, have been duplicated in your timeline? So we'll see, we'll see exactly how that goes when there's a little bit more footage in a timeline that has duplicate footage being used. Um, another question that I've been seeing in the comments on my video is, 
will the dupe detection also be indicated in the browser um, differently than the the used media ranges feature in the browser for those of you who don't know what the used media range feature is in the browser you can change your view options to used media ranges and every single portion of a clip that's used in your timeline has a little orange bar on it which is incredibly useful if you're not using that i highly recommend it so my hope is, is that dupe detection also shows up in um, in the browser as well in some way and uh, especially when there's multiple clips that are duplicated we'll get a better idea with i don't know uh color coding or something that kind of indicates to us um, by a quick you know, glance, what duplicates are what. Now, this is a feature that a lot of pros have been asking for, and I know that for content creators, YouTubers, social media editors, and all that, it feels like something that's not that big of a deal. But when you're working in narrative, documentary, TV, streaming, and then Marcos, you're working in commercial editing, this is a very important feature that you all have been asking for for a long time. And in my video, we got some comments here um, where there was a little bit of pushback on whether or not you need dupe detection. And um, Marcos chimed in about it, um, as well as Thomas Grove Carter. Um, I'm going to read Thomas's um, uh, comment here. This is a feature used by pros all the time, especially useful in drama when you're splitting performance takes and cutting back and forth. You can quickly check you haven't added extra frames later in the process. Um, so that is something that uh, pros have been asking for a lot, and we want to pay attention to that, those specific use cases. Again, it's possible that a great majority of Final Cut Pro editors aren't really using that feature too often. Um, I know it will have an impact on my workflow when I'm working on my documentary projects, but it's not going to be as big of a deal for my YouTube videos, unless I'm using really B-roll intensive YouTube videos where I want to risk make sure that I'm not using um, the same portion of a shot or the same shot too many times in my edit. And it's nice to be able to look at a bird's eye glance, especially for me with A-roll and then different chunks of B-roll across my whole video, to just look at a bird's eye view, you know, where are the duplicate clips in here? Because when I do film B-roll, I'm rolling, I'm going to switch to one here. When I do film B-roll, I, um, you know, I do, I don't just like press record and shoot all my B-roll so that it's all one clip. You know, I very deliberate, I, you know, I press record, I film for five to 10 seconds of whatever my shot is, move on to the next one, and it will be beneficial to be able to see if there's any duplicates in my timeline. So I'm excited for this feature and I know a lot of our pro editors like Marcos and Thomas Grove Carter, real advocates for Final Cut Pro in that high-end pro community. They're really excited about this. And yeah, you hear the jokes, oh, finally Final Cut's just sort of nudging its way to actually being pro, the, the putting the pro in Final Cut Pro. And it is frustrating. It is frustrating that, 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 that this app has been out for 10 years and something like dupe detection is coming at the 10-year mark. So hopefully we're, we're going to see some some additional features being added in this update and that things once the m1 overhaul of the entire mac lineup um, take are done that we'll start seeing um, final cut updates that are more substantial and, and hopefully a little bit more frequent i think you know no matter what apple doing things their way wanting to put the apple magic on these features versus what avid premiere uh, and the other nles have um, you know, sometimes it takes them a little bit longer to do that. And, you know, we wait patiently in the Final Cut community for that. So that covers dupe detection and voice isolation. I'm just going to double check in chat to see if there's been any comments on the whole dupe detection thing. Um, you know, I see uh, Felipe Baez is here. Hello, Felipe. So good to see you in here. You're a huge part of the Final Cut community. Um, and I've been following uh, you on social media and in the different Final Cut videos that you and your crew have put out. So thanks for joining us. Um, if you guys have any comments on dupe detection, definitely feel like you can drop them in or questions. Um, again, I don't have a ton of experience with dupe detection because my pro background with video concert content editing versus a ton of narrative film, a ton of feature documentary. Um, I have not used dupe detection in other NLEs a ton, although I do remember it from Final Cut 7 and it being helpful. Um, it wasn't something that with all the concert content editing I was doing, where it was like this critical feature in Final Cut 7 that I you know, couldn't live without moving on. Um, <laughs> hey, Ben, yeah, you can, you can have pizza and chill during my live streams anytime you want, buddy. 
Um, so thanks for being here, man. Ben's been a huge supporter of the channel um, over the years. And I think I think I saw in my YouTube studio that you're one of like the top commenters on my videos because you've gotten the most hearts from me. So yeah. Whoa, we got Brian Francisco. Brian, welcome to the live stream. Great to be here. No worries being here late. Just want to say what's up. Thanks, Brian. Um, really appreciate you being here and hanging out in our Discord server. A lot of valuable information and excited to get connected with another awesome Final Cut Pro YouTuber. If you guys aren't uh, subscribed to Brian Francisco, he does amazing Final Cut videos where he shows you how to do certain effects and all kinds of cool stuff with Final Cut. Um, he's definitely uh, one of my favorite Final Cut Pro YouTubers, so check out his channel for sure. Thanks for being here, Brian. Um, yeah, so Felipe's just chiming in here too. Um, thanks for following and mentioning. I've been a little bit away from the public view for quite some time, but planning on bringing some new stuff and collaborating this year. Great videos. Thank you. And yeah, I, I have noticed that Felipe as well. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for you to get back um, into things. I know, you know, I saw a lot of your stuff with like Sam Messman um, and some of the other Final Cut Pro advocates in the pro community. So hopefully, whether it's your own content or um, you just getting, you know, into the Final Cut community, Peter Wiggins, all of those folks um we'll see you uh contributing to the whole final cut movement i guess um as we continue to advocate and <laughs> voice our passion for this software um so i'm going to throw up another comment here from marcos before we move on to um this little thing about medium that i wanted your guys's help with um, one of the things i love about fcp is that it's a great nle for all levels of users i mean my 15 year old son edits on fcp for his school projects and his dad as on it for pay for his school yes <laughs> to pay the the tuition or, or what have you for his school and i think that's great and i think that's an exciting thing about final cut i think on the app store it says that the app is rated for four-year-olds and up and i have a six-year-old and i'm excited because i have uh, actually an imac here a 21 and a half inch imac that i'm hoping to get imovie installed on so my daughter can start if she wants to using one of our old iphones to start telling stories with video and if she does, doesn't, no worries. But if she does, that's great. And that's something that potentially, you know, family members could bond over. And I think that's a really important aspect of Final Cut with its accessibility. Um, it's pretty ubiquitous on a lot of Mac systems. And it's a natural level up from iMovie if young people especially are starting to be limited by the tools of iMovie and want to level up to Final Cut Pro. Um, so going on to um, the whole medium thing, so some of you may have seen on Twitter, and I'm going to switch back to my screen here in a second. Um, some of you may have seen me post on Twitter that I do a lot of um, adapting of my art of my videos for YouTube into Medium articles. And for those of you who don't know, Medium the, the way that I uh, the way that I summarize it is it's sort of like the YouTube for articles. And they have a partner program. And um, up until recently, it was basically unrestricted. You could get in. It didn't matter how many followers you had, how frequently you posted articles. But I think they saw some negative effects from that. And they're implementing a new requirement where you have to have 100 followers on your Medium account to stay monetized. Um, now, without taking too long on this, all of last year, my Medium articles got me about $9 in the Medium partner program. But that was really, you know, a year that I spent building my publication, which is based on my production company, Midland Pictures. Um, but I've been posting regularly on Medium, adapting my YouTube videos to the written word, and they're performing, at least from my point of view, really well on the platform. To give an example of the, the increased revenue, this month alone, I'm already halfway through the month, but I'm looking at having around $50 in revenue from Medium. Now, Obviously, this isn't anything earth shattering or life changing, but I think the potential is there for even more growth, especially as I continue to crank out YouTube content, adapting it to Medium, and then writing dedicated articles on Medium as well. So I'm at about 48 followers on Medium. If you don't have an account, it's totally fine if you don't sign up for one. But if you do have a Medium account and you're not following me, I would greatly appreciate some help getting me to that 100 follower threshold so they don't take away my monetization. Um, just a favor, I'm asking all of you, if you found value in my videos and enjoy these live streams, uh, I just would appreciate just a little bit of support in jumping over at Medium and giving me a follow if you don't mind. And if you like the written word, obviously most of you are seeing um, my videos uh, on YouTube and that's why we're all here. But if you prefer to read some of the articles or see some of the stuff that I do just for Medium, um, there's some valuable information there for Final Cut, Apple, and filmmaking as well. So that's my 
that's my big ask in my speech. Uh, we'll move on to the next thing. So the next thing is this article that um, Peter Wiggins wrote for his website, fcp.co, which, by the way, if you all are not checking out fcp.co regularly, um, I highly recommend accessing this website. This is a wonderful website and resource for Final Cut Pro content. Um, I'll pull it up here. I am a picture in picture. And this is the article that Peter wrote, but this is fcp.co. There's articles from everything from high-end workflows like you might see in uh, you know Marcos Castile's um, workflows, editing for commercials, high-end commercials, um, and then things like tutorials from other YouTubers. Um, so it really runs the gamut of everything Final Cut Pro, and it's a great central hub for the Final Cut community. Peter Wiggins is a huge advocate for Final Cut Pro, and I think he even posted um, the video that me and, hey, and Raphael's here. Raphael, what's up? Um, he posted the video where Raphael hosted a bunch of us Final Cut Pro YouTubers, both YouTubers that YouTube about Final Cut and YouTubers that use Final Cut. So just a, a really good addition to the community. Now, what's interesting about this article, and this is actually probably one of the best pieces of content that I've seen out there about the Mac Studio. Peter got his about a week early, I assume directly from Apple, along with the Mac Studio, and he did get the Ultra model, but he did some pretty thorough testing. And as I scroll down here, you know, just did some overview stuff, you know, the, everything from the packaging to how it compares to the 2019 Mac Pro. Um, we won't spend any time on that, although that's a pretty interesting picture. Um, this huge Mac Pro tower and then this little Mac Studio, which is, you know, I know Apple's charts can sometimes be a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, Appleified. But uh, the 80 time or 80 percent faster performance from the Mac Studio versus the 2019 Mac Pro is pretty incredible. Um, I want to get down to some of the data here, and this is this is just this is just crazy. The Blackmagic Speed Test reports that the SSD storage inside the um, Ultra Studio Ultra Studio. I wonder if we're going to start calling it that, the Mac Studio. Uh, 7,267 megabytes per second write and 5,570 megabytes per second read. What? Oh my gosh, this is so fast. I have a huge Pegasus 2 Thunderbolt 2 R8. It's a RAID with internal spinning disk drives. And back when this thing came out, man, it was cutting edge. It was getting somewhere between 550 and 650 read write speed. And, um, it's going to be interesting to look at devices like that, which a lot of us pro users have relied on to handle these massive amounts of footage from our projects. And what this these tests are showing is that you really can take a hit on your export times when you're using a non-internal SSD. Now, I know it's not practical for a lot of us to use the internal SSD in our workflows because the eight terabyte internal drive is incredibly expensive. But even for some of the high-end pro workflows, eight terabytes is getting to be way too little um, uh, space to store this 4K raw, 6K raw, 5.7K raw, 8K raw. And I know not all editors are editing off of the original footage. So not Marcos, I'm sure, and maybe you can say in the comments, I have to imagine that most of your editing is an offline edit where you're using you know, proxies, even if it's 4K ProRes proxies. Um, you know, you're not editing off of the original camera files. Um, so, uh, you know, having having this kind of read write speed from the internal drive is really incredible. Um, but some of these tests that he had, and, and I'm going to scroll past some of these because, you know, we're already seeing here in his tests how much faster the Mac Studio Ultra is. But look at this test right here. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. And the internal SSD versus external SSD times um, with exporting. You can see here an H.264 export of a three minute complex 1080 project from a Final Cut Pro timeline took 33 seconds to the internal SSD. But what is that, four, t four times longer? 33, 66, 99, yeah, about four times, four times longer on an external SSD. Now this external SSD only managed about 700 megabytes per second, you can see here. Um, so this is, you know, some interesting stuff for those of you that are using like T5 Samsung drives, T7 Samsung drives, you know, these, some of these NVMe drives that can get ridiculous read write speeds, 
they're not even coming close, like 2,800 megabytes per second. I mean, that's like a quarter of what the internal SSD can do. So, you know, what impact will will this have on exporting to external SSDs? And in some of my earlier videos on my 14-inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro, I got a one terabyte 14-inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro. I should have gotten a two terabyte. Um, I am purposely editing off of my internal drive, not only to have all the benefits of the read-write speeds, but to also have what may be a huge benefit for exporting your content to that internal drive. Again, I know for a lot of people that are doing feature documentaries, feature films, streaming television shows and all that, even with offline edits, it may not be possible to edit off of the internal drive of a Mac Studio. That's where this new Mac Pro that I assume is going to come out in fall, Apple obviously mentioned it in the last event, we're probably going to see um, you know, a modular tower where you can add really high-end storage and who knows if OWC and Promise and the different hardware manufacturers can come up with PCIe or something else based technology that allows for read write speeds where you're not taking a hit on the export times when you're not exporting to the internal SSD. So I'll be very curious to see that. And another thing that I'm curious, and I don't know if, if, if he did this, is you know, what if your media is stored on an external SSD, but you export to the internal? Now, obviously, it's going to be reading data off of that external to then write to the internal with an export um, or even your rendering. But I'd be curious what the what what the speed difference is there, especially if you're looking at a 500 megabyte per second drive, a 700 megabyte per second drive, all the way up to some of these NVMEs that are 2800 megabytes per second. Again, the big issue with the SSD externals, a single SSD external drive, is they're um, either low capacity and high speeds, or they're slow and higher capacities. And obviously there's things like OWC's Thunderblade, which raids together a bunch of SSDs to get some really fast read-write speeds. Peter didn't test that, but I'll be curious as different YouTubers get their hands in these con configurations, you know, what we're going to be seeing for um, those the differences in export times to internal SSDs versus external SSDs. I think Peter really plants a, a seed in some of our minds. Should we be thinking about relying more on internal storage for some of the projects that we're doing? Uh, Marcos just chimes in, true, I edit from 4K or camera native resolution, transcoded Apple ProRes 422LT for commercial work. For features, straight 1080p Apple ProRes proxy, which is, you know, these are some of the classic um, transcodes that you would do for an offline edit. And then through Marcos's, um, you know, uh, sound turnover, maybe not sound for fit footage, but color turnover and all that stuff that, you know, you get relinked to the original camera files. Um, but, you know, with the feature, Marcos, 1080p ProRes proxy, that's not very data intensive. Is it feasible with this new Mac Studio or the eventual, eventual Mac Pro for you to really seriously consider consider editing off of a big internal SSD? You know, I know there's a steep price tag. You know, the eight terabyte configuration of these drives is just insane. I think the Mac Studio with the fully loaded Ultra is like $8,000, which is much better than the fully loaded 2019 Mac Pro. Um, but, you know, I wonder just to take advantage of those export times, Marcos, when you've got, you know, a screening that you have to get an export out to or, you know, uh, need to upload the latest version to producers or the director or whatever um, through Frame.io or whatever you're using to, to share that stuff or, you know, even live editing, I'm sure that you're doing. Uh, you know, is it is it going to be advantageous to be um, reading from and writing to the internal SSD to really take advantage of these crazy differences in time. Um, now, when we look at uh, back to um, Peter's article, you know, we really see this with H.264. I don't think that Marcos and other pro workflows are delivering H.264 for screenings. I imagine you're writing a ProRes file or if it's being shown in the theater, you know, maybe in a, a format that's more conducive for uh, projector and projection playback, especially if it's a studio film. Um, but, you know, 26 seconds versus 47 seconds, 36 seconds versus 47 seconds, you know, these are, these are, you know, some increases in time that seem small at this level, but this is a three minute project. Now for Marcos, who might be editing a commercial that's, you know, there's a 15 second version, a 30 second version, a 90 second version, whatever, you know, does it really matter? 
Um, but when you start getting into hour and a half long feature, two hour long feature, you know, the Batman is like three hours long. Some of these Netflix shows, um, you know, it, it's is it is it something to is this something that's going to really be magnified um, under those workflows? So just, you know, just a question. It's just interesting because, you know, so much of what we've done as editors has been with external drives, but now with M1 and the speed of these internal drives and all, you know, the chipset, everything communicating uh, so, so efficiently, um, are we missing out by using, by leaning more into externals versus the internal? Um, Felipe says the price is also steep. Yes, very much so for external eight terabyte SSD. Absolutely. And the internal one is normally at RAID zero. So for eight terabyte storage, you'd be using two times four terabytes. Copy that. Good, uh, good clarification there, Felipe. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, that's, that is sort of the big question from Peter's article. And, and this is the, the first piece of content again, where I've really seen these, these kind of, um, detailed numbers on what we're seeing. Uh, uh, one of the other things I'll touch on from this article um, is with the Ultra Studio, um, the HEVC or H.265 10-bit export times. Look what we got with the Mac Studio Ultra here, 36 seconds, 47 seconds, and then on an M1 Max 16-inch MacBook Pro, which I'm pretty sure Peter has maxed out the full, the full, uh, the full version of the M1 Max, 10 minutes, 25 seconds. Holy cow! What a huge difference. So, you know, the magic that, you know, the Mac Studio Ultra is doing to really export this H.265 HEVC footage out quickly is pretty remarkable. And I got the M1 Max base configuration Mac Studio. And although I don't shoot any of my stuff with my cameras in H.265, I do have a Ninja 5 here that I just unlocked the H.265 recording ability. So I'll be curious to test what kind of export times I see um, between H.264 and H.265. You can see here in his chart, um, oh, sorry, I was already where I needed to be. Um, you can see here in his chart that um, with the M1 Max between H.264 and HEVC, there's like an eight minute difference, seven and a half minute difference here between, or eight and a half minute difference between, um, between the export times for those codecs. So that's really, yeah, Felipe, that's what I'm saying, man. These numbers are bonkers. And this, this is something, you know, to take a look at. So if you have not bought an, uh, an, an, a Mac Studio, look at this article very closely and think about your workflow. If you're working with a lot of H.265, whether you're creating uh, proxy media that way or you're delivering that way, um, you know, whatever it is, if you have a, a, a workflow that you think is going to be more heavily dependent on H.265 HEVC 10-bit footage, you may need to pop for that Mac Studio Ultra and leave the M1 Max behind because there's something special going on with the, um, the Mac Studio Ultra to really be able to handle that H.265 footage efficiently. So something definitely to think about. Um, and then I want to touch here on Marcos's article. And, and, and this is a really great write-up, I think, that I had, I had tweeted this out. You know, we don't want to necessarily, like, weaponize our defense of Final Cut Pro, but we often have to, you know, speak about its virtues, but also acknowledge its shortcomings. And I know that a lot of editors in the higher-end Pro workflows who have had a chance to really use Final Cut Pro, um, like Knut Hockey, Felipe, um, Marcos, they have really tried to share their passion for the software with other editors and you know, one of the big roadblocks is it's not ready for Pro. The botched rollout 10 years ago still has sort of this negative brand, this black cloud over Final Cut Pro. Um, but I would really look at this article uh, as something that you can refer to if you are talking to colleagues or you, or you have colleagues that are interested in Final Cut Pro to take a look at Marcos's article, which was just a great write-up and really relates his specific professional workflow situation um, to how Final Cut Pro is really great in that situation and how sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. Like, for example, having to rely on third-party plugins and pieces of software to do things like sound turnover. Um, if that third-party plugin goes belly up and there isn't an alternative, you know, and, and Marcos is in the middle of a big edit, 
what what is he left to do you know hopefully the old version of that software still works but you know you can be in a little bit of a bind so I'll be curious um, if, if any of you, are, uh, again, have colleagues that you are regularly in contact with who really, you know, have some negative things about Final Cut Pro to, to just have this article bookmarked, have it in your arsenal um, to really um, rely on this uh, to, to uh, let me actually pull it up here because I'm not even, we're not even looking at it, to really look to really look to this article as a way to demonstrate how professional editors working in high-end workflows on huge national, international commercial spots for some of the biggest companies in the world are using this software um, to get their work done. Now, again, Marcos makes the point how fast Final Cut Pro is, and that has been something that has been, you know, uh, a, a resounding anthem from Final Cut Pro users is the speed and efficiency of the software and how much time it saves them and quality of life it gives them because they're able to um, have you know another half an hour, hour, hour and a half of their day um, that is theirs that is theirs to keep because Final Cut Pro is so efficient. So thanks, Marcos, for this awesome article, and I'm glad that we were able to connect after me having read it. Um, I just want to pull up one of Marcos's comments. I just finished a feature running time two hours fifty minutes. Every time we wanted to check it out on projection on my Mac Pro, and then he goes on to say. It took around 45 minutes to export at 1080p ProRes from fast internal OWC SSDs, which are around 3,200 megabytes per second. Marcos is looking at the Mac Studio and thinking this machine will save me time. Absolutely. Very crucial time, especially with ProRes exports. Um, you know, this is something that uh, is, you know, Apple's marketing is really pushing hard. Uh, if Even with the 2019 Mac Pro, this thing is blowing it out of the water. And I know several of my pro friends who have the 2019 Mac Pro sold it on eBay already and have the Mac Studio arriving today. So Marcos, I'll be curious to stay in touch with you to hear whether or not you implement the Mac Studio into your workflow and what benefits you see specifically. So um, that stuff, this is just really exciting. And I know for some of you who may have watched the Apple event with me during my live watch party, um, you saw how excited I was when this computer came out. Um, and it really solves a very specific problem in my workflow. I have the 2013 Mac Pro in my edit bay, and I'm actually going to pull up my edit bay here so you all can take a look at it. Um, this is a, an older photo, but... Um, but still, I think for demonstration purposes, we can take a look at this. Um, so this is my edit bay. Uh, I've got a 4K Dell monitor here in the middle. Hopefully you can see my cursor here. Um, that I'm excited to be replacing with the new Apple Studio display. Uh, and then I have two older Thunderbolt displays here flanking left and right. These are all on Visa mounts. With um, th These are all on arms from Foley. This center one is a is a quad monitor arm, um, but I only have two monitors mounted. And then up, up above, I just have a 1080 HDMI Dell monitor that I use for the AV output feature in Final Cut Pro, so that when I have a director, um, you know, in the in the studio with me, um, you know, they can reference a full screen playback up top. Uh, and then down here, just you know, the touch the trackpad and. Uh, 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 the keyboard, which I re I'm replacing with the new Touch ID keyboard. And then I've got an iPad mini here that runs Stream Deck Mobile. My new edit bay is a little bit different. Um, on the left side, I added another iPad mini, and this runs my audio interface from my Behringer X Air XR18. And I have faders here that control all of the different software that I'm running audio through. So Final Cut, Safari, um, what else? My Apple TV. I can actually I can actually use an HDMI switcher to have my Apple TV play to this monitor if I want to watch a movie while I'm editing and don't have somebody else in the studio with me. So, so this is this is all this is all the center of this is all my Mac my Mac Pro my 2013 Mac Pro and it has six Thunderbolt two ports. It's got four USB 3.0 USB A 3.0 ports. Um, the HDMI port, two Ethernet ports, you know, you guys, for the most part, know the connectivity. Um, but the everybody was saying, like, well, why don't you take your 14-inch MacBook Pro and get a dock and, you know, all that stuff and insert it into that situation so you don't have to keep relying on your 2013 Mac Pro. I just, 
it's too much of a pain to do that. I don't want to have like a dock with all the stuff in the in the in the hub, the Thunderbolt hub, and all that stuff. I do want to get one of those eventually, for, or even for the Mac Studio. But I, I really, in a perfect world, would have had a 2013 Mac Pro that just had an M1 in it. I don't need to to be able to put PCI expansion slots and different things and swap out GPUs and all that kind of stuff. I am just editing usually offline edits for short documentaries, short films, um, corporate video, all obviously my YouTube content. Um, yeah, yes, Felipe, that's exactly right. I will miss the amount of Thunderbolt ports. That is the big sort of trade-off with this Mac Studio. Because I have the M1 Max, I only have four Thunderbolt ports. So I am going to have to do some daisy chaining and, and, and some different things that aren't ideal. Now, when we see the new Mac Pro come out, who knows if, um, you know, there's something there that's affordable for me. You know, uh, the 2019 Mac Pro, just to get a, a configuration that I felt was a little bit more future proof, I had to spend between 10 and 12,000 to get that. And it just was not feasible. Um, so the 3,000 that I spent for the Mac Studio is much more in alignment. And I'll use some dongles and do some daisy chaining with my peripherals if I have to, to be able to make that work. The key was, is it was a standalone unit. I could put it on my riser here on my desk, kind of where my lamp is, have access to the front ports, the SD card slot, all that stuff. And it would really be good for, especially that I've been doing a lot more YouTube content, my YouTube content creation. But for sure, because it's more of a Mac Mini Pro than a Mac Pro Mini, um, the ports will be a little bit of an issue, especially when I'm adapting Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 1 um, peripherals into the Thunderbolt 4 form factor. Um, yeah, exactly. And Felipe, you just you keep bringing up great points. Um, he's talking about um, one thing he's missing with the studio monitor, and I thought the same thing compared to the UltraFine, the second Thunderbolt uh, port for daisy chaining. Exactly. We have to use the Thunderbolt port on the studio display to connect to the Ultra Studio. It's a one-to-one -one thing. There's no nothing else can go in that pipeline, and that's a little frustrating as well. That 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 we're we're not able to daisy chain um, off uh, off of it like you can with the Ultra Fine display. So I'm right there with you. I, I'll be curious when I implement this what bumps I I I, I oh, bumps and snags I hit. I am going to be making a video on the YouTube channel about the overhaul of my edit bay to incorporate the Mac Studio as well as the studio display. So any issues that I have with Apple Thunderbolt 2 to 3 adapters, daisy chaining things, trying to get everything connected, um, you'll see that in that video. So if you're not subscribed to the channel, definitely subscribe so you see that when it comes out in the coming weeks. Um, so I am, I think, going to have the Mac Studio up here on the riser for my desk. I'm going to try it up above. Right now, my Mac Pro is actually below the desk on a small shelf. Um, and then below there also I have my two Promise Pegasus 24 terabyte R8s, as well as an old Pegasus 1, Thunderbolt 1 R4 that has like 12 terabytes of storage. And I use that for my YouTube video archive so I can go to the archives if I need to pull up footage. All that stuff's mounted under the desk as well as my sound mixer. Um, so it's going to take some reworking of my cables to get the Mac Studio to work with all of that while it's on the riser. Um, so it'll be a little bit tricky, and um, I, I think it's going to work. I've done a little bit of research to know like what works with the Thunderbolt adapters that Apple sells. I have four of them at fifty bucks a piece, which was you know I already had two, but I ended up getting two more just to be covered. Um, and then any additional Thunderbolt cables I might have to get, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, so I'm excited to do, to do all that, but it's going to be a little bit of a tricky conversion. But this Mac Studio really was what I was looking for. Is it the perfect solution? No. And I'm going to go into that when I you know make a video about can the Mac Studio replace a 2013 Mac Pro or even a 2019 Mac Pro when it comes to um, in-out connectivity. And for a, a a higher end edit bay like mine, which is still, I would argue, a little bit on the lower end because it's not the most current uh, technology. It's not ultra fine displays. It's not driven by Thunderbolt, um, and that's not a disc. You know, like this is a pretty sweet edit bay, but um, but you know, it has some some connectivity stuff going on that I need to work out. You can see down here, like I've got like a USB A hub, and then I have my SD card and CFast reader uh, over here undermounted, so I can plug all that stuff in. 
Um, we'll see if I keep those there or if I just get rid of them because I'll have the Thunder or the USB C ports on the front of the Mac Studio. Um, you know, we'll we'll find out. But that's sort of what I'm facing with the Mac Studio. Um, it is still out for delivery. Let's actually check the shipping status real quick. I told my wife if it arrives while I'm down here on a live stream to let me know and I'll run upstairs and get it. And then, you know, you guys could see uh, see me unbox it on, on. Yeah, so it's just still showing out for delivery. And I don't have like the detailed UPS account where you can like see where it is on the map or whatever. I don't even know if UPS does that. But we are approaching the end of the hour. And I would love to, uh, you know, look in chat, answer any questions. Um, yeah, Felipe, the table is DIY. My buddy DJ and I built it out of, um, getting my audio over here. Um, we built it out of, are those, what are those? Six by, six by tens or something from Home Depot. So we did that and we did like the kind of classic um, plumber's pipe, the steel piping, um, and then fused it all together. Um, with bracing under the desk and all that stuff. But I, I designed it to be like, I think it's like nine something feet wide. And I sit at the center. Um, you can see on here and I'll do a, I'll do a desk tour video here coming up. I have these under slung power outlets that also have USB a charging. And those are really great. When I film my videos, I have three here and then further down the edit bay, I have another, another set down here that you can kind of barely see down here in the corner. Um, and then the studio monitor is just mounted on these kind of kind of <laughs> wooden platforms. Um, but that's been, you know, a really good setup for me and my studio. Uh, it's been great having directors in the edit bay with me while we work on a documentary or whatever we have. Um, uh, so it works out really cool. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have any questions, drop them in. Let's hang out a little bit and chat, um, especially if Final Cut related um, this new software update. Any questions that you have? Thanks, Marcos. I appreciate that. It's uh, uh, well, the Edit Bay was you know a real passion project of mine because I've I've worked on so many ramshackle desks. You, you know, some of you guys know my background working as a concert video content editor. There were many many long days at a card like a folding card table with an iMac in a windowless cement room in Burbank, California. Um, just like hating <laughs> hating the setup because it wasn't my own Edit Bay. So I vowed when I got my studio set up, I would make like my dream edit bay and get everything set up the way I wanted it. And so far this has worked out great. And just as a, as a, as a side note, um, this setup here with this, um, with this, uh, Behringer sound mixer and the faders on my iPad, this coupled with audio hijack and being able to isolate the audio levels from the system sounds to final cut pro, um, uh, let's actually cut back and I'll do picture in picture, but being able to isolate the sounds from Safari, Final Cut Pro, um, it's like it makes editing so much better because what I don't have to deal with is when um, when I'm editing in Final Cut Pro and maybe I'm working with like mixed dialogue and some of it's a little quiet, some of it's a little louder and I haven't really done like a like a normalization of it all. You know, sometimes you're cranking the volume on your Mac to listen to the audio and then all of a sudden you get a phone call or you go to play a YouTube video and it's just BAM! With with Audio Hijack paired with my sound mixer, I have each of those apps on a dedicated fader so I can basically live mix my computer. So I can have Safari a little quieter, I can then have Final Cut a little bit louder, I can have the system sound so like if uh, you know you get a notification or whatever. Um, all of that stuff is separated out, so I'm never blown away by sound. Um, yeah, so Felipe, this setup um, I worked on with my buddy Nick Militello, um, and he has this set up in his edit bay. I'm actually going to LA to hang out with him in early April, so I'm going to do um, a tour of his studio and a dedicated video just kind of breaking down how he has things set up. Um, but essentially, with your sound mixer, um, you know, and I, I should do a, a more deep dive video. Nick really was like the audio engineer who helped me with this. And I kind of, he did it remotely with me and I kind of plug things in and change settings as he guided me through it. So I'm, I'm not like super perfectly knowledgeable of how the Behringer being connected to the computer um, and the in, in and outs and all that stuff work with all the XLRs and whatnot. But basically the Behringer is, um, is connected to the computer and audio hijack can route 
the different applications, whether it's Safari, Final Cut Pro, or whatever, it can route those applications to the different um, faders on the mixing board, the different inputs, essentially, uh, on the mixer. So when you run Audio Hijack, and I have a little window in audio, I, don't, I can't show you here, but I have a little window for each application in Audio Hijack from everything from, you know, whatever iTunes is now, the music app, um, I even have it for like, uh, Twitter. Uh, I, I have them sort of lumped together with, uh, with certain apps that I, I use frequently and I am doing a terrible job of explaining this, but again, with audio hijack, you can, you can customize what applications output to what thing. And with that being to a mixer, I can isolate what channels of the mixer that thing outputs to. And then each of those channels is controlled by a fader. So again, when I'm editing in Final Cut and need to listen to something loud, um, uh, I can have I can have uh, my fader for Safari down low if I want to basically live mix my computer. So um, <laughs> Felipe is blowing me up. We can sidebar too, Felipe. I definitely feel like you can reach out um, and we can go over it, or I can put you in touch with Nick to talk you through it. So the mixer that I'm using is the Behringer X Air XR18. Um, it's just you know kind of your standard mixer. Um, that has uh, a Wi-Fi con a Wi-Fi antenna, and it allows you to connect to an iPad to have all of the faders and all that stuff on an iPad. Uh, it works really well, and then of course it connects to my Mac Pro, and all of that stuff works great. I'll, you know, hopefully all that will work no problem on the Mac Studio. It should, especially with the USB-A ports. Um, so that's what I've got there. Um, <laughs> Felipe's. Uh, the I've got the X the X the X eighteen Behringer Felipe the X thirty two is what my buddy Nick has uh, that was a little bit out of my price range. If you're using Audio Hijack to forward audio from apps to channels, you might like Sound Source. It's a bit lighter on the system than Audio Hijack. That's awesome. Uh, I do like Rogue Amoeba's apps. I will take a look at Sound Source um, Audio Hijack. I haven't had too many issues other than when it's running for too long. Um, I have to sort of restart the the little application window with. Um, with uh so the audio sort of refreshes um so yeah that's uh that's the the edit base setup but i just got so tired of being blown away by the audio from safari or from my phone ringing um when i was you know doing stuff in final cut pro that i, I couldn't take it anymore and nick helped me get this all set up and it's been a game changer for my daily editing um and I can't wait to get back to my edit bay with the Mac Studio because I've been doing so much of my editing on the MacBook Pro because my 2013 Mac Pro with this waveform issue with Final Cut Pro has been, you know, really annoying. Um, so, yeah, I'll check out SoundSource. Looks like Michael. Thanks, Michael, for being here, by the way. Cool video on that 2009 Mac Pro um, that I watched earlier today. You guys check it out on his channel. Um, but he uses sound source as well. And this is what I love about doing these live streams and connecting with all of you, Michael, Felipe, um, everybody. You guys can give me feedback on my workflow to say this is better or worse or, you know, pick up something from what I'm doing. So I appreciate the exchange of ideas. I will definitely check out sound source um, and see if it's something that's a little bit easier to use with than audio hijack. Um, Ian Johnston asks, anyone try Apple main stage for audio control instead of audio hijack? I actually have main stage. I got it when I was an employee at Apple. I just, you know, you get all the pro apps and all the apps for free, but I haven't actually used it. So I'll be curious to check out MainStage for that. Um, Romo Drummer, uh, I know you asked this late. Um, earlier, I mean, did you get AccuSonos D-Breath working? I have not messed with it when it wasn't working the other day on one of my videos. Uh, I didn't, you know, try to troubleshoot it, uninstall, reinstall the plugin. I haven't messed with it. Um, I've been hearing from people in a couple different forums that the AccuSonos stuff is kind of regularly having issues on M1 systems where the plugin's no longer available or whatever is going on. I, in the past, had to uninstall it and reinstall it, which has you know, just been annoying. And, um, uh, and, and I will go through those steps because the deep breath, for the most part, worked really well, I thought, and uh, it's worth it to troubleshoot it. I just haven't gotten to it because of all this stuff going on with Final Cut and um, the Mac Studios rolling out. Um, so yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, Felipe, thanks for live streaming. I know how tiring it is. You should definitely drink that water. That's probably around you somewhere. Having to talk nonstop for an hour straight it is hard. You are right. It is. And I do have my water here, my, my, uh, my hydro flask. Oh, 
Oh, cool. I'm Shango. You're working on a video on Stream Deck to supercharge your editing. Almost no keyboard. I love my Stream Deck mobile on my iPad. I know there are some other um, tools like Touch Portal and stuff like that that uh, can really take things up a notch from what Stream Deck can do. So I'm excited to explore more stuff like that. But Stream Deck so far, the mobile version on my iPad next to my edit bay, which you saw in this picture. Um, just for cutting down a roll and switching multicam angles, um, I have really enjoyed using Stream Deck Mobile. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, chop some Brock, Ben. I don't know, chopping broccoli. You now that's just just what Nick and I, my buddy Nick and I, always always call it. Like we gotta just chop that broccoli. Let's do it. Well, it's 2:05, everyone. I'm gonna wrap up this live stream. We got a solid hour in. Um, I'll look over the live chat replay, and if there's any questions that uh, I missed, um, I'll try to bring it up for the next live stream. I'm super stoked to get my Mac Studio. I should have put it on hold at UPS and just driven out there and gotten it um, because I have a feeling it's gonna arrive tonight, like at six or seven o'clock. Um, but I'm super excited to create more content about it. Hopefully, get on a live stream and show you guys the unboxing and all that, and. Uh, and continue to turn out some new uh, exciting Apple tech filmmaking Final Cut Pro content in the coming weeks. Hopefully that 10.6.2 update comes out soon. I will try to jump on a live stream as soon as the update is released um, and talk through it with all of you, look at the release notes, and then even take a look at the UI if I get it installed on my MacBook Pro so we can hang out live and check it out. Um, anyway, awesome for you all to be here. Thank you so much. Love you all. Thanks for being a part of the channel and the live streams. Um, and, and welcome, Felipe. It was great to see you in uh, my first live stream uh, and great to connect with you on Twitter as well as you, Marcos. I'm so excited to be uh, you know, building and being a part of the larger Final Cut fam. So uh, it's really appreciated for all of you to be, to be here during the live stream. That's all I've got. I'm going to bounce. Go stand at the door waiting for UPS to show up <laughs> like a kid waiting for Santa Claus to come on Christmas morning. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here, and I will see you all soon.